When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who once worked for NASA, and he knows there's a lot that they are not telling you. Here is the captain. Yeah, but I had to quit when I saw Uranus. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring the $50 million man by the great folks over at Three Floyds Brewing. This is an Imperial India Pale Ale. $50 million man has a little something for everyone. It's a little dank with some haze and a touch of pine all held together with tropical fruit. Watch out, evildoers. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps and beer can art. Three Floyds Brewing always gets five bottle caps. Let's give some praise and cheers to our friends that helped us out this week. First up, a big cheers goes out to Janet Skull from Reading, Pennsylvania. And a big we like your jib to Kristen Dewey from Toledo, Ohio. Next up, we have Christine and her crew at Glow Tanning Spa in Williston, North Dakota. Everyone we just mentioned, well, they went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and helped us fill up the fridge for this week's shows. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. You need, you want a Band the Van t-shirt. We have a couple new stock shirts, Band the Van and Creepy Camper, redesigned a little bit. So check those out in the store page. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. For most, in Sumner, Wisconsin, June 16th, 2020, was shaping up to be just another ordinary day, another regular Tuesday, in a small town in the heartland of the good old U.S. of A. But tragically, it would not end up as just another ordinary day. No, June 16th, as far as one man was concerned, was going to go out with a bang, and not just one. This evening will be filled with fire, gunshots, bloodshed, and tears. One vengeful man, with murder on his mind and blood in his eyes, was going to rule the day. And unfortunately, he got just what he wanted. For the man with the gun in his hand, 
no longer cared about what is right and what is wrong. He sought revenge. And in its wake, he left blood on his father's farmland. And when he was done, he burned the whole thing down. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the homicide case of Jim and Nedra Lemke and the search for the man that killed them. A 911 call comes in. So many times these true crime stories start off with a 911 call. But this 911 call is quite different than what we typically have. Yes, the call was to 911 emergency services. But this was not the panicked voice, the caller screaming into the phone, or even a murderous boyfriend or husband calling in and doing his best acting performance attempting to sound like a frightened or grief-stricken loving partner, concerned when he found his much better half unresponsive and bloodied. Nope. Our real-life true crime story for today starts off with one of the most calm and reasonable voices I have ever heard on a 911 call. At approximately 5.48 p.m. on a Tuesday, this is June 16th, 2020, In Sumner, Wisconsin, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office received a 911 call from a female caller. The caller is so nice and considerate that when the responder picks up the phone and says Jefferson County 911, the nice lady says calmly, this is not an emergency, but I am taking care of my parents' house and there's windows broken and we had locked the house down. So our caller is calling in what sounds like a possible B&E. She states that there are two broken out windows on the second floor of her parents' home. Now, before we get into this call any further, we need to provide some background information here. The house is a nice farmhouse on a very large plot of farmland. Lots of acreage. The house appears to be a two-story home, and while this is a very large property, the home is situated right near the street, right near the road, which is County Highway A in Sumner, Wisconsin. When our story picks up, the farm and the house, up until very recently, was owned by an elderly couple, the Andersons. They had owned the farm for many years, likely decades. But both had passed away of natural causes prior to this day. Verdal Anderson, Mr. Anderson, passed away just 11 days prior to this 911 call. Verdal Anderson passed away on June 5th. The property was in probate at this time. His children and their spouses helped to take care of him and the property before his passing. His daughter and her husband were taking care of the house and the property after he died. The 911 caller was his daughter, the one taking care of the home. She identifies herself to Jefferson County Sheriff's Office as 57-year-old Nedra Lemke. She's calling reporting a potential break-in at her deceased father's home located at North 1941 County Highway A. This is just off of State Highway 106. Nedra told the dispatcher that when she and her husband, his name is Jim Lemke or James Lemke, arrived at the property, they noticed that some windows on the home were broken out and they were concerned that there might have been a break in. Well, this location of the farm, it's in a very rural area. Yes. So this will be Jefferson County deputies responding to the call. And a break-in may make some sense, especially for these deputies, because this is Sumner, Wisconsin, a very small rural community. As of the last census, there were less than 1,000 residents of Sumner. So when Jefferson County Sheriff's Office thinks of crime and crime trends in this small community, we are talking about mainly property crimes, things like vandalism, stolen property, breaking and entering, not violent crimes, and not murder. Well, and think about this. It's a small community. You find out that this guy passed away and that there's nobody 
living on the property. The caller, as said, is Nedra. She's very calm. The call is rather short and sweet, but the first responder on the other end says to Nedra, you know, just stay where you are. We'll send somebody out. You don't want to go into the property or into the house because it, there could still be somebody in there. Likely, most of the time, we're talking about a property that's, for the most part, unoccupied, right? You have the children of the deceased coming by to take care of the place from time to time, but there's nobody staying there night after night. So we could have a situation where somebody broke in, or this is simply vandalism, and whoever's responsible, they moved on, and they ain't there anymore. Just for safety precautions, you don't want to go into the house. Yeah, definitely better safe than sorry. So it's recorded that the 911 call from Nedra Lemke comes in at 5.48 p.m. Remember, she is calm and collected when she calls that potential break-in. She's calm. We have a Jefferson County deputy arriving on the scene approximately 12 minutes after receiving the call. So now we are roughly at 6 p.m. Pretty fast response. When he arrives, he finds a scene that he describes as calm. He parks his patrol vehicle and approaches a vehicle that he sees parked in the driveway. Now, he's met with some confusion here at what he discovers. This is because when he gets near the vehicle, he sees a woman lying on the ground. She's right next to the vehicle, which is an SUV that's parked in that driveway. The deputy at first, he's thinking the lady is injured, perhaps. She appears to have fallen just outside of the vehicle. She's laying right next to the vehicle. The first clue that this is not the case is the woman is not moving at all. And the deputy is now speaking to her. She is not responding to anything that he's saying. She's not reacting, not verbal, and not moving. Then he spots what appears to be a gunshot wound on this poor lady. According to police and court documents, the deputy sees an individual sitting in the back seat of the vehicle. He asks this man, who was later identified as Nedra's brother, Kirk Anderson, this man is nonverbal due to mental and physical limitations. So the deputy says to the person that he does not know in the back seat of this vehicle, are you okay? And he gets no response, which we now know is what is to be expected. Right. This is when our calm scene changes dramatically because this is when gunfire starts. The deputy takes cover behind his squad car. The deputy calls into his department that shots are fired. It's the, it's the dreaded shots fired call. Then the shots start up again. The deputy is quick to figure out that the shots, the gunshots being fired in his direction are coming from a second story window inside the home. And I hate to be captain recap, but just so that I'm following you, Nedra calls 911, says there's a possible break into the property the property was owned by her father that recently deceased. Mm -hmm. So the deputy shows up. He thinks he's going to be finding that caller, but he finds Nedra laying down by the truck. She's been shot. Her brother is in the back seat of the truck, but he is nonverbal. Yes. And when we have the shots that are fired at this deputy. So think about this. He's arriving on the scene of this very large property, lots right. of acreage. And when he gets there, there's nobody to bring him up to speed on the situation being anything but calm. Right. Right. When the call came in and all of a sudden he's out of nowhere, he hears gunshots and then realizes these shots are being fired in his direction. He takes cover behind his squad car, calls in shots, fired shots, fired. Well, with the possibility of there being a break in, you're coming to that scene at least on some high alert. But now that you have this victim laying down by the truck, now shots are being fired at you. I mean, this is not your typical call that law enforcement has to deal with. Especially in this area. And good for him and lucky for him in some ways to realize very quickly that the shots are being fired from a second story window coming from that house. Well, like you said, there's a house on this property, but there's multiple barns. So just the fact that you're able to figure out where these shots are coming from. Well, and anybody that's served this great country and, and, and 
done an actual tour of duty where they saw action will tell you that you are at a huge disadvantage when the shooter or the person that you may be in a gunfight with, when they are elevated, when they are above you, you have a lot less cover and really almost no safe place to go to when they have that vantage point over you of being elevated. So good for him to notice right away, hey, these are coming from the second story window. Even though I'm trying to hunker down behind my squad car, I still likely am not very safe here. So what he does is he decides to fire some shots back in the direction of that window. Now, of course, you're hoping maybe you get lucky and you, you hit the, the person that's firing at you, but in all likelihood, he's just hoping to force whoever that shooter is to take cover. And also, just having arrived on the scene shortly before the gunfire starts and not really knowing the lay of the land, he also may not be aware of how many people are actually firing at him. So he decides to make a very smart move to fire some shots back. This is likely going to force the shooter to take cover, giving him the opportunity to flee because he's got to get out of there. Right. And so he does. He he fires. The deputy says he fired four shots in retaliation. And then he runs out of there, retreating down the driveway. And he runs across the road and jumps down into the ditch. You know, you drive those country roads, you see those deep ditches on, on both sides of the road often. He's diving down into one of those ditches to take cover, getting himself further from the hole. I mean, that'd be intense. Then he's going to start crawling through this ditch to get even further from the home. He's already called him backup, and the backup arrives. It's believed it was approximately three or four minutes later when a second deputy arrives on the scene. But if you're the deputy that is you know, running for safety and you called backup, you, you're probably a little worried, too, that you're not bringing other law enforcement agents into a situation where they become sitting ducks. The problem for the deputy is going to be that this is clearly a scene in a situation that is beyond control. Right. Well, again, like you said, we don't know if there's one shooter or multiple shooters, especially for a deputy by himself. And so even when the backup arrives again, this is about three or four minutes after he's in the ditch. Well, he gets in the car with the other deputy and they're going to back up to kind of assess the situation. We have an active shooter. Now we have to figure out what are we going to do? Are we going to set up a perimeter? We have a person that is alive in the truck, in the vehicle that we're concerned about. We have a person who appears to be DOA next to the truck. We don't really know what's going on. We do not know how dangerous the situation can be. And this is when they back up. It's within about five, six minutes that they start seeing Lots of dark smoke and now visible flames that are coming from that house, the same house where the gunfire was coming from. So now we have what's going to end up being a standoff of epic proportions. Yeah, what a crazy scene that is going down. Yes, we have gunfire and now black billowing smoke and large flames coming from the house. So the sheriff's department is in full force at some point. You know, they're calling in everybody. They're in full force on the scene, but they are limited by the sheer danger of the situation. So they are back away from the house on both directions, but they are almost watching this in a way that I'm sure they probably felt a little helpless about the manner and controlling the situation. Using a drone, they are going to start searching the scene. This might help them to determine where the shooter's located, how many shooters they have, and also how many other people that do we have that we need to be concerned about that are in danger themselves. Using the drone, they fly over the property, and when they get near the home and near that vehicle that was parked on the driveway there, the drone spots another body. This time it's the body of a man. They could tell that it was a man that is lying in front of the SUV. This drone will give them the opportunity to send in a SWAT team. But 
here's the problem, Captain. By the time we get the SWAT team in there, the house is burned nearly to the ground, sending them up to, I mean, there's, there's practically no building left by the time they are there. And then we are finding two dead bodies. The woman's body that was found earlier by the deputy, the man's body that was discovered using the drone. And here's the thing. We don't have any shooter or shooters found on that property. And the structure that the shooter was in has now burned to the ground. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Hey parents, Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com podcast. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for telling a friend. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, Captain. Now, we have a very dangerous situation, but in the aftermath, it quickly turns to a very sad, sad situation. The victims that they found on the property, that the deputies found and the sheriff's office found on the property, are later identified as Jim and Nedra Lemke. Yeah. They were the owners of J and L Rot Iron Company and active members of the Faith Community Church, which is in nearby Fort Atkinson. They were fatally shot to death at their late father's County Highway A farm. This is Nedra's father's farm. Now, these two individuals have been described as incredibly wonderful, caring people. And of course I didn't meet either one of them. Don't have any personal direct information or relationship with either of them. But what was telling to me, captain was hearing Nedra's voice on that nine one one call. And just hearing that the first thing that she says to the first responder 
is this is not an emergency. That tells me this person is caring. Like if you have, if you have other problems going on or you have something that you think is an emergency person who's answering the phone, please address that first before you get to my problem. They are described as down to earth people. Her friend describes the couple as the couple that made everything fun. And they were known for being very helpful in the community. And if they saw a problem, they would jump in and they would help out. So now what we have here, Captain, is this horrible situation, the burned down house, two dead victims. And we have to figure out a couple things. Why did this all happen? Who's responsible? And who was the shooter that was inside of that house? And how many shooters do we have? The first thing that I wondered in the autopsy report, the information that's come out about that report is not super detailed, which I don't know how much that's going to help the public here or help us in looking at this case and investigation. Simply put, the news reports say that both died from multiple gunshot wounds. The question I have here is, were they shot at close range or were they sniped? We do know that the deputy himself, when he is approaching the property and approaching the house, it was more of a sniper type situation for the gunfire that was heading in his direction. Well, and like you said, the reason why Nedra called in the first place is they saw these broken out windows. And so it makes you wonder how premeditated this was. But we are going to get our first very big clue very quickly in this case. So in the aftermath and in the rubble, we are now searching the property, looking for answers. And I'm sure searching this property very cautiously, very carefully, because they would expect to find the shooter. Yeah, we already have a, like, like you said, we have this psychopath or at least one, maybe multiple shooters that were already firing at a deputy. I mean, this person or persons, is looking to kill. According to documents, the officers, the SWAT team, and now the sheriff's office, they're searching the property. They find, they very quickly locate a black Dodge Ram truck. This is a Dodge Ram 1500. The vehicle is registered to Lynn Anderson. They find the truck in an outbuilding, and the doors are closed to this outbuilding. So they need to figure out why this truck is there. So Lynn Anderson is contacted by the sheriff's office. What do they say? We found your truck. This is the situation. Why would we find your truck on this property? Lynn Anderson explains to them, well, that's my husband's truck. It's registered to me, but he drives it all the time. And he drives it and uses it for work and transportation And that property is his father's property. So it wouldn't be totally out of the question to find his truck there. But the interesting thing is that her husband, Kevin Anderson, does not keep his truck there. His truck goes where he goes. Right. So one would expect to find the truck with Kevin Anderson. They've searched the property high and low, and they've not found any additional victims. So now we need to figure out why is Kevin Anderson's truck parked in this outbuilding, concealed in this outbuilding, if you will, yet we don't know where Kevin Anderson is. Well, like we said, we have two dead family members to the deceased owners of the property. Now we have another family member that we can't find. So is Kevin a victim of this shooter or shooters, or is he... The shooter. Is he the killer? You're starting to see a hypothesis take shape here, Captain, because following up on that vehicle information, after they've identified who the vehicle should belong to and why it may be there, now they want to know, well, what is Kevin Anderson's relationship to Nedra and her husband, James, or he went by Jim? Right. Kevin is Nedra's brother. Lynn Anderson explains to the sheriff's office that the two of them have not been getting along very well lately. And a lot of that had to do with the recent passing of their father. 
The father, according to Lynn Anderson, Kevin believed that the father was going to leave Kevin Anderson as the executor of the will. Now, from my understanding, Captain, this is what I find to be incredibly weird. There's three kids, from my understanding, and they were all left equal portions of inheritance. Right. According to Lynn Anderson, Kevin Anderson was extremely upset and angry that the father made Nedra the executor of the will. Yeah, this works different in different states and different depending on how you set it up. Sometimes when you're awarded or not awarded, but when you're appointed the executor, you're just making sure you're the one responsible for making sure all these things happen in the will. And you're basically the contact person probably for the attorney. Now, sometimes the executor, if they do a lot of work, they'll get maybe a little bit of a more percentage for doing that work. But everything I see in this case was she was appointed the executor, but everybody was still going to get an equal slice of the pie. Yeah, and we've seen, and I'm thankful that I've not seen this in my immediate family or any of the families closest to me, but... I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there have seen this as well. This inheritance situation can rip families apart and can cause big time disputes amongst those receiving an inheritance and those not receiving an inheritance here. What I think the, the major problem is, is simply the executor status. But I think that goes deeper because I think what is not in these reports, what's what's not direct and clear in these reports, it sounds to me, Captain, like Kevin Anderson had one idea for what they should be doing with the house and the property, the, the large farmland that was owned by his parents. And Nedra and her husband, Jim, who are the executors of the will, had a whole different idea. I think that Nedra was going to sell the home and the property and likely share the profits with all of her siblings. And Kevin may have wanted to keep the house or keep the property or believe that it should have been willed to him individually. Yeah. These situations become difficult because normally if you have a piece of property, then the way it goes down is you go, okay, well we have this piece of property and we're all entitled to one third of the pie. So if Nedra says, look, I don't want to keep the property. It's going to be too much work. Then it it becomes an option for somebody like Kevin to buy the property. But if you don't have the means to buy that property, because he would have to then pay for two thirds of the property for him to own it. Yeah. And again, we don't know the exact details of their will or how everything was broken down. So we could have some of that wrong. We're just trying to make some inferences here because of this incredibly tragic and dramatic situation that has played out. Well, and whether he wanted to keep it or whether she wanted to keep it or sell it, that really doesn't matter. What really matters is that there was a dispute about what was going to happen. And very quickly, Kevin Anderson becomes the prime suspect for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. One, they find his vehicle there. But two, more importantly, they don't find Kevin. They don't find his remains in the burned out house. They don't find Kevin coming back home that night or returning to work the next day. Kevin is MIA and his sister and brother-in-law have been murdered. Well, good for law enforcement for one, finding Kevin's vehicle. And now they're getting some information from Kevin's wife on who Kevin is, but What else do we know about Kevin Anderson? Well, we know this, that 10 days after the shooting and after the fire, we're not jumping to any conclusions here, Captain, because the sheriff's department announces that they, that Kevin Anderson is wanted for homicide and arson charges. So they issue a warrant for his arrest on June 26, 2020. Now, Anderson himself 
has been referred to as the black sheep of the family. He wasn't somebody, he was somebody that lived nearby, lived by his parents, but he wasn't always visible and in attendance of a lot of family activities. And so his, the children of Nedra and Jim have said that, well, they would see him maybe once or twice a year. This would be primarily at like Christmas time or a larger family event. He wasn't somebody that was around. It, he wasn't somebody that seemed to have a very good or close relationship with his family. So referred to as the black sheep of the family. And part of this could be his personality. Uh, part of this could be his alcoholism. There are reports that he had bouts of alcoholism throughout his adulthood. My guess is it's probably a combination of both. And we talked about family disputes, especially the disputes after the father passed away, but it sounds like there were some family disputes with Kevin Anderson before the father passed away. And we know that he was ex upset about the will and the executor status. But what's interesting is when the sheriff's department goes to talk to or to find Kevin Anderson, hoping to find him at his home and speaking to his wife, Lynn, not only does the wife back up this idea that he's mad about the will, they find the will on his kitchen table. Like he's been pouring over and, and reading through it for days. Well, cause just to be clear, we have his vehicle, but we have nobody that have seen Kevin Anderson on this property. There's nobody that saw Kevin Anderson and said, I could identify Kevin Anderson. And I know for a fact he was the shooter. And we know that he had access to the property and may have had access to the house. And I say may have had access to the house because of some strange things that were going on. So after his father passed away, there are plenty of reports out there from Jim and Nedra that say that they believe somebody was tampering with the property. So the locks on the house at some point had been changed. Keep in mind, Nedra is the executor of the will and of the estate. She didn't change the locks. So the locks had been changed. Somebody set up a trail camera near the home trying to, I guess, record the comings and goings of people. I can get that like for security purposes, but this was something that was unbeknownst to Nedra and Jim. They find the trail camera there and they're like, okay, who set this up? Right. They're probably not scratching their heads for very long. They probably know that it's their brother, Kevin, that set it up. And they also told several people that when they would return to the property, the next day or after a couple of days that there would be a light or lights on that they did not leave on when they left. So somebody's accessing the house, somebody's accessing the property and somebody's changing the game there at the house and at the property, changing the locks, setting up the trail camera, leaving lights on. And they, we do know that when Nedra and Jim came to the house that day on the day in question, she reported at least two broken out windows that her report on the 911 call states was the second floor of the home. Well, and see, this is what makes me wonder how, how premeditated this was, because if they have these arguments, we have escalation as far as the property be, being tampered with, and maybe Kevin, knowing that this is going to come to a head, he goes to the house, and for whatever reason, instead of opening up windows... He just bust out those windows because he's going to use those as a way to essentially kill his family members. I'm glad that you hit on this because a lot of the early reports that were coming out back in 2020, Captain, were stating that they believe that an argument led to the death and the murder of Jim and Nedra. And I look at this situation and the more and more I look at it, I don't think we had so much of an argument. Maybe that's a blanketed statement that this was an ongoing argument. Right. But what I see here is a lot of premeditation. Now, listeners out there in listener land, all of you beautiful people out there, this case is extremely important, even though we have the sheriff's office telling us who committed these murders. 
it's incredibly important because this man, Kevin Anderson, is still on the run. We are coming up on three years now, and they've not located or apprehended this individual that they have said is responsible for a double homicide, the attempted murder of a deputy, an arson burning down a home of supposedly somebody he loved and cared about, and he's also wanted on weapons charges. And the reason why Kevin Anderson is wanted on weapons charges is this ain't this dude's first rodeo. He's got prior convictions. This comes from when he was a young man. So when he was a younger man, him and a friend were, and it's described two different ways, okay, in the reports that I've read, Uh were vandalizing some cars or breaking into some cars. My guess is they were probably breaking into the cars, and if they got caught, they might get lucky if somebody, if the officer or a judge saw it as potential vandalism. But it doesn't end there. They were inside drinking in this bar all night long, getting nice and toasted, and then they go out and they're doing whatever to these vehicles. Well, these vehicles belong to the patrons of that bar. Right. So somebody eventually comes out and says, hey, what are you doing to my vehicle? And then goes in and tells the other patrons, oh, but, you know, uh, so-and-so's out there. Kevin and his buddy are out there. They're breaking into cars. So the patrons come running out of the bar ready to take these two guys down. Unfortunately, Kevin pulls a gun and starts firing shots at the people running out of the bar. Yeah, but just to be clear, this is this is Kevin when he's in his 20s, but he's at this present time of the, the murder of his sister and his brother-in-law. He's in his 60s. Yes, I believe he was 61 years of age when his sister and brother-in-law were murdered. But what's so crazy, too, is if you see uh, this property, and the, there's actually an individual on YouTube. I, I probably should try to find his information. But there was a guy on YouTube that visited. The, Faces of the Forgotten Okay, is what yeah. I have written down here for, for the YouTube gentleman. Yeah, so basically what he did was he just goes to the, the the crime scene, basically, and it's it's modern day, so the house has been de- demolished. So he, so he just shows you the property, shows you where the house was, and then uh, I believe he actually visits the graves of the victims to pay respect. Um, very nice little video, but it gives you a very good sense of this property and what yep. this deputy and what the SWAT team and what all law enforcement was dealing with that day. What's so crazy about it is it's not like there's a bunch of properties like right beside this house. Like no. he basically vanished into thin air. It's very weird because looking at the property and the cool thing is from this faces of the forgotten guy on YouTube You can see how it looks roughly today. I think this was probably about a year ago or something since his video came out. But you have grass there where the house once was. There's still a shed, kind of a larger shed. And I don't know if that is a barn, too. Yeah, I don't know which one of those buildings is where Kevin Anderson concealed his vehicle, because that's what I believe that whole intention was, was to hide his vehicle. And we'll get into that in a minute. But but the crazy thing is. One, you get to see it's it's very much like those old farms where it's a lot of acres, huge property. There's no house next door. There's no house to the left or to the right or across the street. But their home is very close to the, the road itself. Right. And then you have two, at, at least two outbuildings. I only saw two, maybe three. There's not much sp- there's not much opportunity for anybody to take any cover, right? You have the house and it's not like there's a lot of trees or anything like that. However the hell Kevin Anderson got out of there, he got lucky because well, he didn't get lucky. I shouldn't call it that. His gunfire shooting at that deputy forced them to retreat. And not, yeah, and, and forced them away. to go back yeah. far from the house. And he probably slipped out the back door and ran in some direction. But also made me wonder if there was some kind of accelerant. And is is it possible 
that he actually died in the house and they just never recovered his remains. That's interesting because the warrant, as it states, is on June 16, 2020, Kevin Anderson is alleged to have shot and killed his sister and brother-in-law at their family farm in rural Jefferson County. Kevin Anderson then proceeded to burn the farmhouse down and shot at a sheriff's deputy responding to the farm. Kevin Anderson is believed to have fled the area as no remains were found in the farmhouse. Right. So let's give a quick description of Kevin Anderson, because that's what we are here for. You know, the true crime community often talks about things like crowdsourcing. Well, there's no bigger or better job for the true crime community in the crowdsourcing arena than apprehending these wanted individuals, these very dangerous individuals that are still at large. So Kevin Anderson would be 64 years old in 2023. He is a Caucasian male, six foot tall, approximately 200 pounds with blue eyes and brown hair. He's one of these guys though, Captain. I saw multiple pictures of him and he, his hair is thinning and receding, but he's one of these guys that can look very different to me from picture to picture. He has sometimes the Fu Manchu type of mustache and other times he has a large goatee. Oh, yeah. Sometimes he has the old 70s porn stash. And sometimes he's clean shaven. To me, with his facial hair, I think he looks dramatically different with the different types of facial hair or no facial hair. Yeah, and we'll post pictures of him on our social media, but I agree with you. If you see him with the porn stash, he looks like one individual. You see him with the goatee, almost looks like a whole different guy. But even more so when he's clean shaven and he puts on his glasses. And I hate to judge a book by its cover, but do you get the same vibe that I get? And I know part of that is layered with we know what he's being charged with. Right. And we know about his previous crimes. But isn't he one of those dudes that you just look at him and you get the, oh, this guy's probably a jerk. This guy's probably, he's not, a, he, <laughs> this guy's probably a jerk face. You know what I mean? Like he gives you, he has the, the appearance of the guy. That's probably not a lot of fun to be around. He's not a big bag of laughs. This guy, he looks when he has his glasses and he's clean shaven and he's, and he's partly bald to me, he looks like one of those just grumpy college professors. But when you see him with the porn stash or you see him with a goatee, uh, the, the the pictures I've seen, remember how we've talked to individuals that have come in contact with uh, serial killers or killers, and they talk about once they got an attitude, once they rubbed this murderer the wrong way, how their eyes became like black as coal. There's a couple pictures of Kevin that I just think he, he looks evil. He looks I'm having a hard time seeing the blue in his eyes as they're described. That's what I'm saying. There's like, it's like, there's, there's something, um, there's something evil when you see these pictures. And again, we, we, we know the story, but, uh, there's something off and you can tell that just by these pictures. But like I said, that when he's clean shaven with the glasses, he just kind of looks like a, a grumpy old college professor. And Kevin Anderson is not a prime suspect. Make no mistakes about it. He's well beyond prime suspect status to the point where Kevin Anderson has been officially charged with homicide charges. So Kevin Anderson is facing a class A felony, two of them, for homicide, carrying a sentence of life in prison. He's also facing an additional attempted homicide charge which is a class B felony with a maximum sentence if convicted of 60 years in prison, that arson charge, a maximum sentence of $100,000 and 40 years in prison, and the illegal possession of a firearm by a felon charge, which carries a maximum sentence of $25,000 and 10 years in prison. And we have some more detailed information to get 
into to get to in a follow-up episode, but it would be incredibly irresponsible of us to delay until then to get to this very important information. It's the reminder of crowdsourcing. This is where you, the listener, can help. Law enforcement authorities are requesting the public's assistance in the search for Kevin P. Anderson from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Again, Kevin P. Anderson is described as a six-foot-tall Caucasian male who weighs about 200 pounds and has blue eyes and balding brown hair. We will post photos of Kevin Anderson on our social accounts at truecrimegarage.com, at TCGNIC on Twitter. Anderson should be considered to be armed, likely at all times. And it should go without saying that he is extremely dangerous. Authorities strongly caution the public and anyone who sees Kevin Anderson, do not approach him. Do not confront Anderson. Rather, call authorities immediately. If in Wisconsin, please get in touch with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office by using one of these two numbers. 1-920-674-7310 or call WeTip at 1-800-78-CRIME. If outside of the great state of Wisconsin, please call the United States Marshals Service Headquarters at 1-877-926-8332. These telephone numbers will be listed in this week's show notes. So much more to get to. Join us back here in the garage, same bat time and same bat channel. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it. Hey, parents, Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast.